एंड वेलकम टू रीडोपीडिया दैट इज नीम का एनसाइक्लोपीडिया और आज हम अपना फिनिश करने जा रहे हैं मॉडर्न फिजिक्स का लास्ट चैप्टर दैट इज सेमी कंडक्टर इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स एंड आई होप यू आर एंजॉइंग ऑल द ऑडियो बुक्स गिवन ऑन दिस चैनल एंड स्टे ट्यून बिकॉज एक बहुत ही अच्छा सरप्राइज आने वाला है आपके लिए इस चैनल पे सो सब्सक्राइब टू द चैनल एंड स्टे ट्यून सो नाउ लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड चैप्टर फोर्टीन सेमी कंडक्टर इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स materials devices and simple circuits 14.1 introduction devices in which a control flow of electrons can be obtained are basic building blocks of all electronic circuits before the discovery of transistor in 1948 such devices were mostly vacuum tubes also called valves like vacuum diode which has two electrodes that is anode and cathode triode which has three electrodes that is cathode plate and grid tetrode and pentode respectively with 4 and 5 electrodes in a vacuum tube the electrons are supplied by a heated cathode and the control flow of these electrons in vacuum is obtained by varying the voltage between its different electrodes vacuum is required in the inter electrode space otherwise the moving electrons may lose their energy on collision with the air molecules in their path In these devices the electrons can flow only from the cathode to the anode that is only in one direction therefore such devices are generally referred to as valves these vacuum tubes generally are bulky consume high power operate generally at high voltages and have limited life and low reliability the seed of development of modern state solid state semiconductor electronic goes back to 1930s when it was realized that some solid state semiconductors and their junctions offered the possibility of controlling the number and the direction of flow of charge carriers through them simple excitations like light heat or small applied voltage can change the number of mobile charges in a semiconductor note that the supply and flow of charge carriers in the semiconductor devices are within the solid itself while in earlier vacuum tubes or valves the mobile electrons were obtained from a heated cathode and they were made to flow in an evacuated space or vacuum no external heating or large evacuated space is required by semiconductor devices they are small in size consume low power operate at low voltages and have long life and high reliability even the cathode ray tubes used in television and computer monitors which work on the principle of vacuum tubes have been replaced by liquid crystal display that is lcd monitors with supporting solid state semi electronics much before the full implications of semiconductor devices was formally understood and naturally also be described 14.2 classification of metals conductors and semiconductors on the basis of conductivity on the basis of relative values of electrical conductivity or resistivity the solids are broadly classified as number 1 metals they possess very low resistivity or high conductivity number 2 semiconductors they have resistivity or conductivity intermediate to metals and insulators number 3 insulators they have high resistivity or low conductivity The value of rho and sigma given above are indicative of magnitude and could well go outside the ranges as well. Relative values of the resistivity are not the only criteria for distinguishing metals, insulators and semiconductors from each other. There are some differences which will come clear as we go along this chapter. Our interest in this chapter is the study of semiconductors which could be number 1 elemental semiconductors that is silicon and germanium number 2 compound semiconductors examples are inorganic cds gas cdse inp etc organic anthracene doped thalocyanins etc organic polymers polypyrrol polyaniline polythiophene etc Most of the currently available semiconductors are based on elemental semiconductors silicon or germanium and compound inorganic semiconductors. However, after 1990, a few semiconductor devices using organic semiconductors and semiconducting polymers have been developed signaling the birth of futuristic technology of polymer electronics and molecular electronics. 
In this chapter we will restrict ourselves to the study of inorganic semiconductors particularly elemental semiconductors of silicon and germanium. The general concepts introduced here for discussing elemental semiconductors by and large apply on most of the compounds semiconductors as well. On the basis of energy bands According to the Bohr atomic model in an isolated atom the energy of any of its electron is decided by the orbit in which it revolves but when the atoms come together to form a solid they are close to each other so the outer orbits of electrons from neighboring atoms would come very close or could even overlap this would make the nature of electron notion in a solid very different from that in an isolated atom Inside the crystal each electron has a unique position and no two electrons see exactly the same pattern of surrounding charges because of this each electron will have a different energy level these different energy levels with continuous energy variation from what are called energy band the energy band which includes the energy in the valence band all remain bound and no free electrons are available in the conduction band this makes the material an insulator but some of the electrons from the valence band may gain external energy to cross the gap between the conduction band and the valence band then these electrons will move into the conduction band at the same time they will create vacant energy levels in the valence band where other valence electrons can move thus the process creates possibility of conduction due to electrons in conduction band as well as due to vacancies in the valence band Let us consider what happens in case of germanium or silicon crystal containing n atoms. For silicon the outermost orbit is the third orbit while for germanium it's the fourth orbit. The number of electrons in the outermost orbit is 4 that is 2s and 2p electrons. Hence the total number of outer electrons in the crystal is 4n. The maximum possible number of electrons in outer orbital is 8. So for the 4n valence electron there are 8n available energy levels these 8n discrete energy levels can neither form a continuous band or they may be grouped in different bands depending upon the distance between the atoms in the crystal at the distance between the atoms in the crystal lattices of silicon and germanium the lower band which is completely occupied by 4n valence electrons at temperature of absolute zero is the valence band the other band consisting of 4n energy states called the conduction band is completely empty at absolute zero the lowest energy level in the conduction band is known as ec and highest energy level in valence band is known as ev Above EC and below EV there is a large number of closely spaced energy levels as shown in figure 14.1 The gap between the top of the valence band and bottom of the conduction band is known as the energy band gap EG It may be large small or zero depending upon the material These different situations are depicted in figure 14.2 as discussed below Case 1 This refers to a situation as shown in figure 14.2a one can have a metal either with conduction band is partially filled and valence band is partially empty or when the conduction band and valence band overlap when there is overlap of electrons from valence band can easily move into the conduction band this situation makes a large number of electrons available for electrical conduction when the valence band is partially empty electron from its lower level can move to a higher level making conduction possible therefore the resistance of the such materials is low and conductivity is high case 2 in this case as shown in figure 14.2b a large band gap eg exists that is eg is greater than 3 electron volt there are no electrons in the conduction band and therefore no electrical conduction is possible note that the energy gap is so large that electrons cannot be excited from the valence band to the conduction band by thermal excitation this is the case of insulators case 3 this situation is known shown in figure 14.2c here a finite but small band gap that is eg is less than 3 electron volt exist because of the small band gap at room temperature some electrons from valence band can acquire enough energy to cross the energy gap and enter the conduction band 
these electrons can move in the conduction band hence the resistance of semiconductors is not high as that of the insulators in this section we have made a broad classification of metals conductors and semiconductors in the section which follows you will learn the conduction processes in semiconductors 14.3 intrinsic semiconductor we shall take the most common case of germanium and silicon whose lattice structure is shown in figure 14.3 these structures are called the diamond like structures each atom is surrounded by four nearest neighbors we know that silicon and germanium have four valence electrons in this crystalline structure every silicon or germanium atom tends to share one of its four valence electrons with each of its four nearest atoms and also to take share of one electron from each such neighbor these shared electron pairs are referred to as forming a covalent bond or simply a valence bond the two shared electrons can be assumed to shuttle back and forth between the associated atoms holding them together it shows the two dimensional representation of silicon or germanium structure shown in figure 14.3 which overemphasizes the covalent bond this is shown as idealized picture in which no bonds are broken such a situation arises at low temperatures as the temperature increases more thermal energy becomes available to these electrons and some of these electrons may break away the thermal energy effectively ionizes only a few electron sorry atoms in the crystalline lattice and creates a vacancy in the bond as shown in figure 14.5a the neighborhood from which the free electrons has come out leaves a vacancy with an effective charge this vacancy with the effective positive electronic charge is called a hole the hole behaves as an apparent free particle with effective positive charge the intrinsic semiconductors the number of free electrons ne is equal to the number of holes nh that is ne equals to nh equals to ni where ni is called intrinsic carrier concentration semiconductors possess unique property in which part apart from electrons holes also move suppose there is a hole at site 1 as shown in figure 14.5a the movement of holes can be visualized as shown in figure 14.5b an electron from the covalent bond at site 2 may jump to the vacant site 1 thus after such a jump the hole at site 2 and site 1 has now an electron therefore apparently the hole has moved from site 1 to 2 note that the electron originally set free is not involved in the process of hole motion the free electron moves completely independently as conduction electron and gives rise to electron current ie under an applied electric field remember that the motion of hole is only a convenient way of describing the actual motion of bound electrons whenever there is an empty bond anywhere in the crystal under the action of an electric field these holes move towards negative potential giving the hole current ih the total current i is thus the sum of electron current ie and hole current ih that is i is equal to ie plus ih it may be noted that apart from the process of generation of conduction electrons and holes a simultaneous process of recombination occurs in which electrons recombine with the holes at equilibrium the rate of generation is equal to the rate of recombination of charge carriers the recombination occurs due to an electron colliding with a hole an intrinsic semiconductor will behave like an insulator at t is equal to 0 kelvin as shown in figure 14.6a it is the thermal energy at higher temperatures which excites some electrons from the valence band to the conduction band these thermally excited electrons at t greater than 0 kelvin partially occupy the conduction band therefore the energy band diagram of an intrinsic semiconductor will be as shown in figure 14.6b here some electrons are shown in the conduction band these have some from the valence band leaving equal number of holes there example 14.1 carbon silicon and germanium have the same lattice structure why is carbon insulator while silicon and germanium intrinsic semiconductors solution the four bonding electrons of carbon silicon and germanium lie respectively in the second third and fourth orbit 
Hence, the energy required to take out an electron from these atoms will be least for germanium, followed by silicon and highest for carbon. Hence, the number of free electrons for conduction in germanium and silicon are significant but negligibly small for carbon. 14.4 Extrinsic Semiconductor The conductivity of an intrinsic semiconductor depends upon temperature, but at room temperature, its conductivity is very low. As such, no important electronic devices can be developed using these semiconductors. Hence, there is a necessity of improving their conductivity. This can be done by making use of impurities. When a small amount, say few parts per million of a suitable impurity is added to the pure semiconductor, the conductivity of the semiconductor is increased manifold. Such materials are known as extrinsic semiconductors or impurity semiconductors. The deliberate addition of desirable impurity is called doping and the impurity atoms are known as dopants. Pentavalent with valency 5 that is arsenic, antimony, phosphorus etc. And number 2 trivalent with valency 3 like indium, boron, aluminium etc. Now we shall discuss how the doping changes the number of charge carriers of semiconductor. Silicon or germanium belongs to the fourth group of the periodic table and therefore we choose the dopant element from nearby fifth or third group. Expecting and taking care that the size of the dopant atom is nearly same as that of silicon or germanium, interestingly the pentavalent or trivalent dopants in silicon or germanium give two different types of semiconductors as discussed below. Number 1 N-type semiconductor Suppose we dope silicon or germanium with a pentavalent element as shown in figure 14.7 when an atom of plus 5 valency element occupies the position of an atom in the crystal lattice of silicon. Four of its electron bond with four silicon neighbors while the fifth remains very weakly bound to its parent atom. This is because the four electrons participating in bonding are seen as part of effective core of the atom by fifth electron. As a result, the ionization energy required to set this electron free is very small and even at room temperature it will be free to move in the lattice of semiconductor. For example, the energy required is 0.01 electron volt of germanium and 0.05 electron volt for silicon. To separate this electron from its atom, this is in contrast to the energy required to jump the forbidden band at room temperature in the intrinsic semiconductor. Thus, the pentavalent dopant is donating one extra electron for conduction and hence is known as donor impurity. The number of electrons made available for conduction by dopant atoms depends strongly upon the doping level and is independent of any increase in ambient temperature. On the other hand, the number of free electrons generated by silicon atoms increases weakly with temperature. In a doped semiconductor, the total number of conduction electron Ne is due to the electrons contributed by donors in an extrinsic semiconductor doped with pentavalent impurity, electrons become the majority carriers and holds the minority carriers. These semiconductors are therefore known as N-type semiconductors. For N-type semiconductors, we have Ne is very much greater than NH. Number 2. P-type semiconductor this is obtained when silicon or germanium is doped with trivalent impurity like aluminium, boron, indium, etc. The dopant has one valence electron less than silicon or germanium and therefore this atom can form covalent bonds with neighboring three silicon atoms but does not have any electron to offer to the fourth silicon atom. So the bond between the fourth neighbor and the trivalent atom has a vacancy or hole as shown in figure 14.8. Since the neighboring silicon atom in the lattice wants an electron in place of a hole, an electron in the outer orbit of an atom in the neighborhood may jump to fill this vacancy, leaving a vacancy or hole at its own site. Thus, the hole is available for conduction. Note that the trivalent foreign atom becomes effectively negatively charged when it shares fourth electron with neighboring silicon atom. Therefore, the dopant atom of p-type material can be treated as core of one negative charge along with its associated hole as shown in figure 14.8b. 
it is obvious our majority carriers and electrons are minority carriers therefore extrinsic semiconductors stored with trivalent impurity are called p type semiconductors for p type semiconductors the recombination process will reduce the number of intrinsically generated electrons to ne we have for p type semiconductors nh is very much greater than ne note that the crystal maintains an overall charge neutrality as the charge of additional charge carriers is just equal and opposite to the ionized cores in the lattice in intrinsic semiconductors because the abundance of majority current carriers the minority carriers produced thermally have more chance of meeting majority carriers and thus getting destroyed hence the dopant by adding a large number of current carriers of one type which become the majority carriers indirectly helps to reduce the intrinsic concentration of minority carriers the semiconductor's energy band structure is affected by doping in case of extrinsic semiconductors additional energy states due to donor impurities and acceptor impurities also exist the energy band diagram of n type silicon semiconductor the donor energy level is slightly below the bottom of the conduction band and electrons from this level move into the conduction band with similarly for p type semiconductors the accepted energy level ea is slightly above the top ev of the valence band as shown in figure 14.9b with very small supply of energy an electron from the valence band can jump to the level of ea and ionize acceptor negatively at room temperature most of the accepted atoms get ionized leaving holes in the valence band thus at room temperature the density of holes in the valence band is predominantly due to impurity in the extrinsic semiconductor the electron and hole concentration in semiconductor in thermal equilibrium is given by nenh is equal to ni square though the above description is grossly approximate and hypothetical it helps in understanding the difference between metals insulators and semiconductors in a simple manner the difference in resistivity of silicon germanium and carbon depends upon the energy gap between their conduction and valence band for carbon silicon and germanium the energy gaps are 4.5 electron volt 1.1 electron volt and 0.7 electron volt respectively lead also is group 4 element but it's metal because the energy gap in this case is 0 electron volt I'm skipping example 14.2 for you to solve it later or you can pause the video and solve it right now. 14.5 PN junction. A PN junction is the basic building block of many semiconductor devices like diodes, transistors, etc. A clear understanding of the junction behavior is important to analyze the working of other semiconductor devices. We will now try to understand how a junction is formed and how junction behaves under the influence of external applied voltage. 14.5.1 PN junction formation. Consider a thin p-type silicon semiconductor wafer. By adding precisely small quantity of pentavalent impurity, part of the psi wafer can be converted into nsi. There are several processes by which a semiconductor can be formed. The wafer now contains P region and N region and metallurgical junction between P and N region. Two important processes occur during formation of a PN junction: diffusion and rift. We know that in an N type semiconductor, the concentration of electrons is more compared to the concentration of holes. Similarly, in a P type semiconductor, the concentration of holes is more than the concentration of electrons. During the formation of PN junction and due to this from N to P it leaves behind an isolated donor or N side this ionized donor is immobile as it is bonded to surrounding atoms as the electrons continue to diffuse from N to P a layer of positive charge on N side of the junction is developed similarly holes diffuse from P to N due to concentration gradient it leaves behind an ionized acceptor which is immobile as the holes continue to diffuse a layer of negative charge on p side of the junction is developed this space charge region on either side of the junction together is known as depletion region 
as the electrons and holes taking part in the initial movement across the junction depleted the region of its free charges. The thickness of the depletion region is of the order one tenth of a micrometer. Due to the positive space charge region of N side of the junction and negative space charge region of the P side of the junction, the electric field directed from positive charge towards the negatively charge develops. Due to this field, an electron on P side of the junction moves to N side and a hole on N side of the junction moves to P side. The motion of charge carriers due to electric field is called drift. Thus, a drift current which is opposite in direction to the diffusion current starts. Initially, diffusion current is large and drift current is small. As the diffusion process continues, the space charge regions on either side of the junction extend thus increasing the electric field strength and hence drift current. This process continues until diffusion current equals to the drift current. Thus, a p-n junction is formed. In a p-n junction under equilibrium, there is no net current. The loss of electrons from n region and gain of electrons by p region causes a difference of potential across the junctions of the two regions. The polarity of this potential is such as to oppose further flow of carriers so that a conduction condition of equilibrium exists. In figure 14.11 shows the p-n junction at equilibrium and the potential across the junction. The n material has lost electrons and p materials has acquired electrons. The n material is thus positive relative to the p materials. Since this potential tends to prevent the movement of electrons from N region to the P region, it is often called as barrier potential. 14.3 Can we take one slab of P type semiconductor and physically join it to another N type semiconductor to get a PN junction? Solution No. Any slab, howsoever flat, will have roughness much larger than the interatomic crystal spacing, and hence, continuous contact at atomic level will not be possible. The junction will behave as discontinuity for flowing charged electron carriers. Fourteen point six semiconductor diode. A semiconductor diode is basically a PN junction with metallic contacts provided at ends of the application of an external voltage. It is a two-terminal device. A PN junction diode is symbolically represented as shown in Figure 14.12b. The direction of arrow indicates the conventional direction of current. The equilibrium barrier potential can be altered by applying an external voltage V across the diode. The situation of PN junction diode under equilibrium is shown in Figure 14.11a and b. 14.6.1 PN junction diode under forward bias. When an external voltage V is applied across a semiconductor diode such that P is connected to positive terminal of the battery and N side to the negative terminal, it is said to be forward biased. The applied voltage mostly drops across the depletion region and the voltage drop across the P side and N side of the junction is negligible. This is because the re resistance of depletion region, a region where there is no charges, is very high compared to the resistance of N side and P side. The direction of the applied voltage V is opposite to the built-in potential V0. As a result, the depletion layer width decreases and the barrier height is reduced. The effective barrier height under forward bias is V0 minus V. If the applied voltage is small, the barrier potential will be reduced only slightly below the equilibrium value and only a small number of carriers in the material, those that happen to be uppermost energy levels will possess enough energy to cross the junction. So the current will be small. If we increase the applied voltage significantly, the barrier height will be reduced and more number of carriers will have required energy. Thus the current increases. Due to applied voltage, electrons from N side cross the depletion region and reach P side. Junction boundary on the each side, the minority carrier's concentration increases significantly compared to the locations far from the junction. Due to this concentration gradient, the injected electrons on P side diffuse from the junction edge of P side to the other end of P side. Likewise, the injected 
holes on end side diffuse from junction edge of end side to other end of end side. This motion of charged carriers on either side gives rise to current. The total diode forward current is sum of hole diffusion current and conventional current due to electron diffusion. The magnitude of this current is usually in milliamperes. 14.6.2 PN junction diode under reverse bias. That end side is an external voltage V applied across the diode such that end side is positive and P side is negative is said to be reverse biased. The applied voltage mostly drops across the depletion region. The direction of applied voltage is same as the direction of barrier potential. As a result, the barrier height increases and depletion region widens due to change in electric field. The effective barrier height under reverse bias is V0 plus V. This suppresses the flow of electrons from N to P and holes from P to N. Thus, diffusion current decreases enormously compared to the diode and the forward bias. The electric field direction of the junction is such the diode reverse current is not very much dependent on applied voltage. Even a small voltage is sufficient to sweep the minority carriers from one side of the junction to the other side of the junction. The current is not limited by the magnitude of the applied voltage but is limited due to concentration of the minority carrier on either side of the junction. The current under reverse bias is essentially voltage independent up to critical reverse bias voltage known as breakdown voltage. When V is equal to VBR, the diode reverse current increases sharply. Even a slight increase in the bias voltage causes large change in the current. If the reverse current is not limited by an external circuit below the rated value, the PN junction will get destroyed. Once it exceeds the rated value, the diode gets destroyed due to overheating. This can happen even for diode under forward bias if the forward current exceeds the rated value. The circuit arrangement for studying the VI characteristics of diode as shown in figure 14.6a and b, the battery is connected to the diode through a potentiometer or rheostat so that the applied voltage to the diode can be changed. For different values of voltages, the value of current is noted. A graph between V and I is obtained as shown in figure 14.16c. Note that in forward bias measurement, we use a milliameter since the expected current is large, while a micrometer is used in reverse bias to measure the current. You can see in figure 14.16c that in forward bias, the current first increases very slowly, almost negligibly till the voltage across the diode crosses a certain value. After the characteristic diode, the diode current increases significantly even for a very small increase in diode bias voltage. This voltage is called the threshold voltage or cut-in voltage, which is 0.2 volt for germanium diode and 0.7 volt for silicon diode. For the diode in reverse bias, the current is very small and almost remains constant with change in bias. This is called the reverse saturation current. However, for special cases, at very high reverse bias, the current suddenly increases. This special action of diode is discussed later in section 14.8. The general purpose diode and not used PN junction diode primarily allows flow of current only in one direction. The forward bias resistance is low as compared to the reverse bias region. This property is used for rectification of AC voltages as discussed in next section. For diodes, we define a quantity called dynamic resistance as the ratio of small change in voltage delta V to small change in current delta I. That is, Rd is equal to del V upon del I. I am skipping example 14.4 for you to solve it later or you can pause the video and solve it right now. So that's it for today. We'll be stopping right here and finishing off with part 1. The part 2 of the video starting from 14.7 will be uploaded very soon. So thank you for listening to this audiobook. Subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for it.